to Rock Book Show. I'm Kimberly Austin, and joining me today is author Michael Walker. Michael, thank you for being here. Oh, it's great. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is Michael's new book, actually just out yesterday. Congratulations. Michael, was 1973 on your radar all this time, or how did you come up with that year specifically? It, it was in general. Before I, I got the... the if we kind of finalized this idea and crystallized it more, I'd kind of had this vague idea to write about the backstage culture of rock and roll in the early 1970s. And I remember thinking when I was going to the concerts in the early 70s um, in Chicago where I grew up, you, the audience would be out in, in these big, in the International Amphitheater, which was a converted, it was a barn that we used to sell livestock, right? And the stockyards right next to it. And the place half the time smelled like cow dung and pot smoke because of these, <laughs> this concert. But, so the audience is out there kind of packed into this place and the band would come out and play and mostly they played in street clothes and it was a very, you know, very much sort of solidarity with the audience. And one night I was there and I kind of like looked around the barricades and backstage were these three or four big black Cadillac limousines. And I thought, okay, there's some, a disconnect there between what, the, what these guys are putting on and what they're actually doing backstage. What, they're, what they were doing backstage turned out to be a lot, right? There was a lot of luxury living and everything else. But that was just coming into play in the early 1970s. So that was sort of my original idea and then we sort of focused it on um, I, then I discovered that 1973 was actually this kind of seminal year. A lot of stuff happened. I mean, in, the Watergate scandal was, was spinning out of control. Um, there was the, the uh, Paris Pizza Corps was signed, supposedly ending the war in Vietnam. It was a year that was sort of stuck in both the 60s and 70s. It had one leg in the, seven, in the 60s. Um, a lot of the 60s ethics and ethos and hippy-dippy stuff was still around. It hadn't quite died off yet. But the other leg was in the 70s. There was a beginning of a sense of, of, of money and decadence and the stuff that eventually would really flourish around 75, 76 and when the disco era really got going, which was then, of course, torn down by the punks almost right afterwards. So I, I like writing about times that are these little, um, and reading about them as well, that are sort of um, transitional eras. And the early 1970s were were that in 1973 in particular I thought was a real fulcrum like year. And a little bit ironically the DEA was also born in 1973. Yeah, <laughs> the DEA was born, the World Trade Center opened in 1973. Here's a great uh, duality. In, in Los Angeles the Roxy opened which is this which is still around which is a great showcase nightclub which delivered Bruce Springsteen his career. Those were the days that a nightclub could still make a career if you had a great run at the, at, at, at the, at the, the Roxy or at the Troubadour where Elton John got his start from big run. The same year, CBGB opened in New York. So this is the alpha and omega of the scene. The one that the, uh, the, the Roxy was really where all the, the, a lot of rock bands hung out there. It was really about the sort of the cocaine and, and hard rock excesses of the 70s. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, television and the Ramones and Blondie and all these bands are, are getting ready to tear this down in, in a club the same year. So that's what's cool about 1973. There's it's this great sort of yin and yang of what's going on. Yeah, and Amazingly, because I, I really didn't think about this till I read the book, you, you were focusing on Alice Cooper, The Who, and Led Zeppelin, but there is a list of bands that were also touring that year that reads like a who's who of rock and roll. It just goes on and on and on. I mean, I can't recite it by memory, but if you just think of a band alive in the 1970s, they were on the road in the 1970s. They were playing. It was. It's like, just just, just take your pick. It's Johnny Winter, Edgar Winter, Peter Frampton, Ario Speedwagon, Uriah Heep, Deep Purple, um, you know, Elton John. Dark Side of the Moon came out in 1973. Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon. I don't think they were on the road that year. They have been the only band that wasn't, but you think they would have been given the album was out. But it just, you you, you can't imagine how many bands. John Fogarty said of, of the early 1970s, he goes, it was like the 19, I think, 27 Yankees. It's a great championship Yankees team. He said, you had to bring that just to step up to the plate. Um, and and a lot of them, I, I also wanted, I have great affection for all of that music, even the, even the more ridiculous, just because it's weathered pretty well. But also for the bands that were really that I felt that were really near and dear to my heart. And so the Who, Alice Cooper, and Led Zeppelin are somewhat arbitrary choices um, because they were just personal favorites of mine, and I, I really wanted to kind of shine a light on all of them. But also those bands, um, 1973 was their peak. That was that was the year that they had their biggest tours, their biggest albums, and um, and after that they started kind of tra trailing off as the 70s went on. These bands came back from those tours utterly changed. I mean, they were, they were, they were, they were um, especially Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper broke up about six months after their tour. This is their triumphant tour. They've been working for this their entire, for five years, they've been striding to this moment. They have the number one album in the country. They're selling out the same halls Led Zeppelin is selling out. And they just blew apart afterwards. I mean, it's amazing. Incredible. And when The Who was out, Keith Moon was actually not in good shape that year, but an immaculate timekeeper still. So, yeah, he, uh, well, the, the Quadrophenia tour was just fraught from the beginning because Pete Townsend was an enormously ambitious man in, in every aspect and creatively, and he was trying to do something that technology wasn't quite up to yet. 
because the album Quadrophenia is full of horns and, and synthesizers and strings and sound effects and whistling locomotives and tea kettles and waves crashing on this, on this shore. And he was trying to reproduce all those sounds in concert. Well, back then, nowadays you would just press a button on an MP3 and they have these things queued up and synced. Back then, you had to run analog tapes. So this poor sound engineer, Bob Pridden, was sitting on the right side of the stage, or stage left, I think, and had to, with great precision, cue these things up when they were supposed to. And they were analog tapes. So naturally, they didn't work a lot. <laughs> and and, in, and they, they did a pre-tour before they hit North America. And one night, I can't remember what town it is. Towns had just lost it. They, they, there was the opening for one of the songs. That the sound effects came in 10 seconds early, and it was just a complete disaster. And he ran over, and he tore all the sound tapes out of their thing, smashed his guitar, stalked off stage, and then they came back on and didn't do any more of Quadrophenia. The other problem was Keith Moon had to play with a click track. He had these headphones, and he would duct tape the headphones to his head because if he lost the click track, he would lose time. The band would then could no longer keep in time. And John Entwistle said it was the most difficult thing in the world to play because it had to be played perfectly. Because if you messed up just a little bit, you got you get out of time with the tapes, and that's it was it was just a disaster in some regards. But on the nights that it worked, apparently it worked really well. And then he passed out, and they pulled somebody from the audience. This is this is this is what you want your opening night to be, right? They're, <laughs> these guys are they've they've just flown over from England. England. I think they maybe have had one night in the United States. They're probably pretty jet lagged. Although road warriors, maybe they aren't. And they. Uh, so they're backstage at the Cow Palace, and the story varies, but Keith Moon is handed a drink by a couple of groupies, and in, within the drink is probably PCP, or some other powerful elephant-like tranquilizer. And, but he was just, he would take anything. And Peter Rudge, their manager, I interviewed Peter Rudge for the book. He was, of course, at that show. He was their manager, co-manager and road manager. And he said Mooney would just, like, he would just go for the ride. He said he, said he probably knew he was being drugged. He probably, he, he probably didn't even occur to him. He said, well, if I'm drugged, I'm drugged. If I'm not, I'm not. So he makes, get through it. Yeah, he makes it, he makes it through a lot of the really demanding quadrophenia material that I think was during Won't Get Fooled Again, or one of the big songs. He just literally nodded out into his tom-toms like this. And they dragged him off stage, they took him backstage, they put, threw him under a shower, gave him a shot of vitamin B12, sent him back on the stage, you know, Townsend and Daltrey. There's actually, if you go to a website called Wolfgang's Vault, it's, um, they have video of this. The whole thing is videotaped, so you can watch the whole thing. It's actually very sad because he's really not all there and they put him back in fact with the drums and he tries, I think he collapses again during Magic Bus and they just more or less kind of haul him out like you're taking a fish. He's just flopped over. Then Townsend goes to- But wait, there's more. <laughs> Townsend, Townsend walks to the microphone. He said he was really pissed because they were doing really well and he was just getting into it and he didn't want to stop. And he said, can anybody play the drums? <laughs> and he goes, but I mean somebody good. And there was in the front row, there was this guy, Scott Halpin from Muscatine, Iowa who was a drummer in a bar band. He was visiting a friend in like Daly City, California or something. He hasn't played in a year probably. And his friend goes, he can, he can. The guy's going, no, no, no. <laughs> so Bill Graham, the promoter, the famous Bill Graham, um, they, they, they get the attention of these guys. Bill Graham says, can you really play? And he goes, he goes, yeah, yeah, I can do it. So they usher him backstage. He's like 18 or 19 years old. Give him a shot of brandy. Townsend reaches through the cymbals and shakes his hands. He goes, I'm going to lead you. Just follow my guitar. And they played about three or four songs. They did Smoke Sack Lightning. And a couple other ones, and apparently he quits himself pretty good. But he said afterwards, he said he said he could not believe. He said he did three songs, and he said he was ready to pass out. You say in the book the '60s didn't have the infrastructure to hold this. It's kind of easy to see why now. Yeah, uh, the, the infrastructure for the '60s bands were playing. They, they would do tours, but even as late as like 1967, 68, they were still going on these Dick Clark caravan tours, where everybody get an awful bus and go across the country. One of the reasons Buddy Holly is not with us today because he was on one of those tours in the '50s. He was so fed up with the bus that he chartered a private plane, which unfortunately flew into the ground right for takeoff. So it was dangerous, and it was kind of about seat of the pants stuff. But then in the early 70s, when they started discovering how much money could be made on these tours, then the people started paying attention. And the, then the, the touring aspects became much more organized, um, much more on the road luxury, first of all. And Led Zeppelin, finally, the apogee of this starts in 1973, when the manager of the Monkees, Ward Sylvester, uh, converted a Boeing 707-720, which is a shortened version of this big 707. It's about the size of Air Force One, and turned it into a plane specifically to rent to rock bands. As David Lieber from Alice Cooper said, if somebody, it's like it was the Air Force, rock and roll Air Force One. He said, and, and the Starship, which now has passed into legend, it only lasted about three years, but it had a bedroom in the back with a circular waterbed, and it had a full-length bar with an organ, and John Paul Jones and Les Zeppelin used to play the organ during their, their flights. Um, you know, back then very, luxurious but primitive video monitors all that stuff and my favorite thing there's an antechamber that looked like a fake british manor that had like a fake british fireplace in it so all the bands would feel right at home 
on the Starship. So the Starship was was the ultimate indulge. And uh, Peter Frampton was still in service in 1976 when Rocket had gotten huge because of these 73 tours. And Peter Frampton leased it for his tour. And he said it was great. He said you walked off the plane, you could hear the trunks and the limos popping down down at the end of the stairway. So, but what a thing that you know, th what was happening with that was these bands are getting isolated from their audience. These audiences are being herded into these big arenas behind big barricades. There's security in front of the stage. It's not for the audience, it's for the bands. It's to protect the bands from the audience. And so even though they talked about how much they love their audiences, and I think they did. They loved the fact they were coming to see them. They owed them everything. They, were, they weren't cynical about that. But at, at the same time, there was, a, there was a demarcation being formed where in the 60s, that was not the case. In 19, the early 1970s, the backstage pass was invented, essentially. I found the guy that invented it. His name is Dave Otto. He's, they're still in business. And he perfected a technique for printing on flexible rayon. And that's where these backstage passes came from that people wear now. So, but you didn't need backstage passes in the 60s because there was a lot of bleed through between the audience and, and the, at the Winterland or the Fillmore ballrooms. There was, you, there was the people, you weren't, there wasn't a sense of, we're the performer, you're the audience, pay your money and, and watch us and then please leave at the end if we pocketed your money. There was much more of a communal feeling to things. I think there was that great story in the book about that guy who hitchhiked and became a roadie for one of the bands. That was Ron Volz. Yeah, Ron Volz became Alice Cooper's first roadie, and he had hitchhiked to Woodstock because he was wanting to see it. And he took one look at this thing, and he got backstage because it wasn't that hard to get backstage at Woodstock. They did have barriers, and you can see the very beginnings of it. If you look at the Woodstock DVD, especially I think one with the bonus features on it, you can see that there is a VIP area back there. There's a place, and the bands are being flown in by helicopter because they have to. But if they could have gotten limousines in, they would have taken them in, even in 1979. But Ron took one look at this, and that's the life for me. He moved back to Ohio, and Alice Cooper was coming through, and he hooked up with them, and they just hired him, and he became their first roadie. There was a lot of that going on. A lot of guys, um, it, was the, it really was the circus had come to town back then, and a lot of people that were bored and restless and they wanted to do something, you could change your life. And then Ron Volz, you know, I don't know what he would have done the rest of his life in Ohio, probably been, had been fine, but he then got to see the world. You know, it was like joining the Navy, except there's groupies in a private plane. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit better than the Navy, <laughs> I'm thinking.